me know what her verse is for the year. What was it? Habakkuk 3.18. How many can quote that? Okay, Habakkuk 3.18 says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Are you glad you're saved this morning? Are you glad you're in God's house? This is the day that the Lord hath made. It's time that we stand up, sing from our hearts the joy that he gives us because of our salvation. Don't sing just to sing loud, but sing from your heart. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord be glad in it. Say that the Lord had me.
Summer and winter, springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in the courses above. Join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faith with mercy and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. have been met, say amen. amen. <coughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day and for your many blessings. And Lord, we Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your house, fellowship with one another. And Lord, more than anything, to worship you, the one and only true God. Lord, we thank you for all that you have provided for us, all of our needs each day. Lord, we just pray for those that are unable to be with us this morning for whatever reason. Just be near to them. Lord, at this time as Mac comes, I just pray that you would just sing through him the words that you want us to hear. Lord, take the tremble out of his voice. Take the shake, the nervousness away from him. And Lord, just sing the song that you have for us this morning. In your name I pray. Amen. All times of day seems long. Our try hard to bear we're tempted to complain to murmur in despair but Christ will soon appear to catch his bride away all tears forever over on God's eternal day it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One glimpse of His dear face, all sorrow will erase. So bravely. Sometimes the day looks dark with not a ray of light. We're tossed and driven on, no human help in sight. But there is one in heaven who knows our deepest care. Just 
let Jesus solve your problem. Just go to Him in prayer. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see Christ. One of his dear face all sorrow will erase so bravely run the race till we see Christ life's day will soon be gone all star forever past we'll cross the great divide Harp, a home, a crown. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burdens down. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when. So bravely run the race till we see Christ. <clears throat> Said something there in that that song that Max sang that uh, <laughs> it's going to be amazing. The tempter will vanish. Amen. And if anyone here says that you're not tempted every day of every week, you're not telling the truth but that day when Christ returns there'll be no more tempting there'll be nothing tugging at your heart when we see Jesus hymn number two come thy fount of every blessing it's been a long time since I sang this song so I may need some help come thy fount of every blessing turn my heart to see thy grace streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of love is praise teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues of love praise his name I fixed upon it name of God's redeeming love hitherto Stand hymn number two ninety five. Hymn number two ninety five. Revive us again. <clears throat> Yeah. 
number 497 and number 497 near to the heart you 
said that he was a natural. His talents and abilities were beyond question. Others said that he was born for the limelight. No, no moment was too big for him. As a matter of fact, when the stakes were the highest, that is when he shined the greatest. Everyone knew his name and everyone knew his skill set. His opponents were not too thrilled to go against him. And too many times he simply toyed with those who challenged him. When he was in the arena, all eyes were on him. He always made things look so easy. It was said that he was religious, but you would not know it at times. He was able to achieve a great things here on earth, and his influence was known far and wide. He sure knew how to attract a crowd and his personal life was a far greater than what his public life seemed to be. He rarely enjoyed privacy because he was so big. He was too important. He piled up victory after victory. He was top of his game in his generation. While his skill set without, was without question, one thing he had trouble with conquering, that was his own self. And that is the trouble with many of us. While we may have some earthly success, we seem to struggle over our own selves. We have some small victories from time to time, and the problem that plagues, plague this man is the message that we'll speak about this morning. We are just simply inconsistent with our walk with the Lord many, many times. The challenge before you and I today is to find that balance and consistency with the Lord at all times. You see, while you have many things going for you, if you fail spending time with the one who made you and loved you, and you are still not able to achieve those things that God has set out for you, then, my friend, your personal happiness and contentment, you'll never find your purpose. It has been said that all of our heroes have blind spots, and that includes the gentleman that we'll look at today. 
Today, if we look up heroes, they often distinguish themselves in some ways, and often they do so beyond belief. Allow me to encourage you with this. You do, you do not have to dribble a basketball, throw a touchdown in the Super Bowl, or score a win and go, because the Lord is simply looking for those who will arise each day, take some time out for Him, live for Him, and have a dedication for Christ and Him alone. You see, can I tell you this morning, we're not all destined to be Super Bowl champions, but we're all destined to be something in Christ Jesus when we allow Him a greater portion of our lives. If you'll just be faithful and available, I can tell you, God could do something great and mighty in your life. But can I tell you, we live in a generation that wants quick success. We, we, we want to be at the top before we want to have those challenges in life. And you that are sitting out here, here's what you've learned. You've learned that you've climbed that ladder, but you've climbed it with some bumps along the way. You've climbed it with some difficulties. You didn't get where you're at now because you have just had a free reign. You've got there because of some hard work and some hard knocks. Turn with me, if you will. We're going to introduce something that maybe you've already know, but we're going to connect some dots in this story, and hopefully it'll help you understand a little bit more of this character in Judges chapter 16. Judges chapter 16, if you will, Brother Chris, in verse number 25. Judges chapter 16 and verse number 25. And it came to pass, when their hearts were merry, that they said, Call for Samson that he may make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house and made him, made them sport. And they set him between the pillars, and Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars whereupon the house standeth that I may lean upon them. And now the house is full of men and women, and the lords of the Philistines were there, and there upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson, again, here's that word, made sport. It has been said that Samson was a, the, one of the physically strongest men who had ever lived. However, because of his moral weakness, he never did realize his great potential. And before you start thinking about something else, let me give you this. How many of us have known men and women of God that that seemed to us in our own natural natural mindset they had everything going for them. They had they they had the great spiritual wherewithal. They they like 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 Miss Judy they could sing like Brother Randy they had a voice that could that could just lift up her congregation. You you've all known people that that had certain gifts and abilities. And, and, and you've been in churches or in congregations, and here's what you thought. If I could only sing like that, if, if I could only do what they could do, but isn't it a far cry to have a gift or ability and to, and, and to see that on display? And those people that have those gifts or ability, they never do quite come to the point to where they've just given God everything. Yeah, they can sing. Yeah, they can preach. Yeah, they can do these wonderful things. But there is just something in their life. It just seems like they never get to the top where they need to be. Yeah. And let me just share this. All of us in this room have known preachers. Let's just pick on those guys. We've all known preachers that just seem like they had it. Whatever it was, they had it. They could preach and they could do everything. This last uh, couple of weeks, the world lost a preacher. No one knows about it, but just a few in this room. His name was Jack Van Impey. And, and Jack Van Impey, during his heyday, in his early days, there was nobody better in his day than this guy. He could pack out churches, and he could preach, and he could teach. and He had, a, he had one of the most uncanny abilities to memorize Scripture. At one time, it said he memorized the whole New Testament. Now, I don't know about you, to memorize the whole New Testament, come on, come on with me. you you got to have a little bit of that. I can't remember if I walk in the room sometimes what I walked in the room for. 
Some of you will get that here in a minute. You, you walk in there and you'll stop and say, now why did I even come in the room for? And here was this guy that memorized the whole New Testament. In his early age, man, this guy was a powerful speaker. We heard him in Tennessee many times. He could, he could, as a young boy, I was just transfixed upon this man, how he could preach. And, and by the way, he could pray, play the accordion like nobody I've ever heard in my life. That guy could play an accordion and could make it do anything he wanted to do. But somehow later in life, he kind of drifted off. And yeah, he was still in the ministry. And yeah, he still was on television. And he had the television program. And he still had his uncanny ability to quote scripture after scripture. But he was not never that same guy. He had the ability. He had more ability than, 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 than you and I could ever harness. But he just never seemed to put it together. Have you ever known people like that? Come on, everybody look up here. Have you ever known anybody like that that had the ability to preach, to teach, but it just seems like they could just never get to the top? It seemed like they could never just take that one final step. And here was Samson. He was a superstar of his generation. There was nobody that had a name greater than Samson. If you lived in his time, guess what? You knew Samson. Some of you don't know this, but did you know that Samson was a judge and he judged 20 years? Did you know that? This guy had an important position. Not only did he have an important position, but he also had a supernatural ability with strength. Now, it seemed like Samson's Hall of Fame credentials might not be as much because we know later in life he started drifting and he started doing some things and he 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 had an uncanny ability to choose the wrong ladies. Somebody amen. He had the uncanny ability to choose those people that were not good for him. And it's like people today. Listen to me, church people. There are some of us... Watch. Everybody look. We seem to be drifting this morning. Everybody look up here just a minute. Let me have your attention. It just seems like there are some of us that always know how to pick the wrong people. It just seems like it's not that you set out to do that on purpose, but you just seem to draw the wrong crowd. And before you know it, the preacher is hunting you down, begging you to come back to church, begging you to be back in your place. You just have the uncanny ability to draw people that's not good for you. And if I say something to you about it, then guess what? I'm the bad guy. And Samson was like this. He just drew people that was not, come on, good for him. And he just seemed to do that over and over and over. But I'm going to show you something. I want to show you something in this story that you might have never seen before. Something that I had to absolutely do a double take as I was doing some investigation on this story again. So stay with me. Hopefully you'll learn something that might challenge you for the gospel's sake. Now, in we understand that there are some things of, 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 of his life that we are familiar with. So let's just, uh, uh, let, let, let's just look at something. As I was reading and studying about Samson, he did have his big game moments. Those times that he really stood out for Christ and consider something that, that I want you to see. Look, if you will, at Judges chapter 15. Now, this may not be familiar with you. Judges chapter 15. you have that, Brother Chris? Verse 9? Yeah, go ahead. Judges chapter 15, verse number 9. Then this is where we're going to be camping for the next few minutes. It's not going to keep you long. But I want to show you something that may, may just take you back a little bit. Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah. Now, that word Judah there is important. And I'll show you why. And they spread themselves. Look at verse 10. And the men of Judah said to the Philistines, look what they're saying. Why are you come up against us? Why are you picking on us? Why do you always seem like you're against us? And they, the Philistines answered, to bind Samson are we come up to do to him. Look at that next part. To do to him as he has done to us. Okay. 
do, do you have the story kind of in, 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 in processed in your mind? Here comes the enemy. Now, I'll get this in a minute. The Bible says they're in Judah. Why is that important? I'll show that to you. And the, and, and the good guys simply said this. Why are you coming to us? We're tired of you picking on us. We're tired of you invading us. What is your problem? And they says, you've got a guy that we want. And we got, you got a guy by the name of Samson who is making our lives miserable. And because he makes our life miserable, guess what? Come on, come on, come on. We're going to make your life miserable. Basically, that's what's going on. Are you with me so far? Okay. Stay with me because there's a twist on this story. That's very, very, very odd. And the men of Judah, look, well, just look at verse number 11. You, you got to see this to believe it. Look at verse number 11. <clears throat> now watch this. Then 3,000 men of Judah. Now think about that a minute. 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock and said to Samson. Now here's what they're saying. They've already talking, they've already spoke to the Philistines. And they've ordered Philistine says, we want Samson. Now the good guys come to Samson, the judge, and says this. Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? Stop right there just a minute. Do, 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 do you see what they just told Samson? Mr. Samson, do you realize that the Philistines want to be our rulers? And, and by the way, can I tell you? Samson was quite familiar with that, all right? He knew that. So they were trying to give him a piece of their mind. Now watch. What is this that, look at this word, thou hast done unto, oh, look at this, us. Now, here's what I think is humorous about this. As long as Samson is fighting their battles and he's winning the battles, there's not no problems. When the Philistines come and get a little bit cranky, now they start turning on Samson. Come on, come on with me. Now that he's not doling out, and now they don't see the victories piling up, and now they see Samson not in the physical condition that he once was or, 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 or whipping the Philistines, now they're saying, what are you doing to us? Watch this. And look what he says. As thou, well, I love this, as they did unto me, so have I done what he says unto them. It seems logical to me, right? Somebody act like you know what I'm talking about, right? Here's what he says. They done it to me. I'll do it to them. It only seems right. Now, you would think that the story would end right there. You would think that that Samson's guy, Samson's men, Samson's comrades would have taken that and simply went on with that. Uh, that's quite not what's going on. Now, it's interesting because it's something that I never picked up, and it's it, what we'll go through here. Now, they are coming in retaliation for what Samson had done to them. You can be sure of this one thing. Now, listen to me, church. Satan will not sit back and allow you to have spiritual victories. His goal is to weaken you by discouragement, by disengagement, and by delusion. He will even try to get you to join his side. Now, now I want you to plug into something with me this morning. I, I, I want you to just think about something that seems so far-fetched that you here this morning, you can't believe this. So watch. You that are sitting here can't believe what I'm fixing to tell you. There's no way that you can picture this. Matter of fact... If I were to come up to you individually, you would just not believe it. So I'll just tell all of you. It takes less time. And here it is. Did you know that Satan has great success in getting some of you to believe, come over to my side and you'll be better? Now, if I told some of you, that, that, that is his tactic. And if I told some of you that you're going to buy into that in 2020, here's what you would say. Preacher, come on. I'm not going to do that. You see, Peter thought he was good when Jesus says, Peter, 
I'm going to tell you something that you're not going to believe, but Satan's going to convince you to go over to his side. And what did Peter say? Up, Lord, you can, come on, uh, you can count on me. I'm going to stand on the rock. I'm going to be there for you, God. And I want to tell you what, now, 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 James and Peter, I mean, James and John and those other lesser disciples, <laughs> I could see them doing that, but not me, Lord. I'm as solid as you got. Why does Satan still do these things today? You know why? Because he has success with it. Yeah. He has success in convincing you to join his side. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems so far-fetched. Why would somebody that loves Christ why would somebody that believes in a death, burial, and resurrection, why would somebody invest all of the time that you've invested in your life, all of a sudden get in a tight spot and believe that Satan is right? Why would you do that? Well, preacher, I wouldn't do that. Are you sure you wouldn't? When you get in a tight spot, what's your mindset? See, I've had people do this. I've had people react to me in different ways. Listen, I, listen to it. Come on, come on. We're not plugging it. Come on, come on. I've had people tell me things that in a normal situation they'd have never told me. I get involved in a situation this, this week that I knew somebody was been out of shape. I understood that. They were facing a difficult moment. And right in that difficult moment as I was, as I was visiting with them, and can I tell you what happened? Out of their mouth just came a string of, let's just say more than questionable Vocabulary. Now, here's what I was doing. I understand that they were going through a lot. And I understand that they were just facing some difficult moments. But here's also what I understand. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Can I tell you this? When you're pressed beyond measure, when your life turns upside down... I understand that it's just hard. I understand the difficulties. I've been there more times than I want to be. But can I tell you this? When you are in that spot, don't go to Satan's side. Don't just believe what he's telling you. Something like this. Well, if God loved you so much, he wouldn't put you into that. If God was a God of love, then you'd be spared for this. And I've had that question asked me this week. Preacher, I don't understand. We are trying so hard, and yet the harder we try... Come on, you, you can finish that statement. The harder we try, the more we seem like we be, are attacked. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. What I told DeWitt several months ago it was this. The higher the level, the more of the devil. Yeah. Count on that, my friend. The higher you claim, the more of the devil is going to come your way. And can I tell you this? If it's true in your Bible, it is also true today. God, listen, the devil don't want you to get closer to him. He don't want you and he's going to do everything he can. But let me just show you something else that you might not have seen before. Now, in verse number 9, it says, The Philistines went up and pitched in Judah. Now, wait a minute. Judah is a good guy's territory. Judah is where the guy, guys with the white hats live. Come on. <laughs> Judah is the good guys. Now think about this. Samson did not go back home because it was too close to where he had defeated the Philistines. So he headed for a more secluded location. Somewhere far from the Philistines. So Samson thought he would be safe in Judah. But the enemy knew where he was. So now the men of Judah, Samson's comrades want to compromise with the Philistines. By the way, by the way, by the way, by the way, are, are you still with me? Hang with me a little bit. When you start opening up a dialogue with Satan, there's your first mistake. Yeah, that's right. When you start trying to compromise with him and saying something like this, well, you know, devil, you may be right about this faithfulness bid or this given bid or this witnessing bid. It's not what it's cracked up to be. And if God loved me like He said He did, I don't understand why I have to go through this. And slowly but surely, you just start making these little bargains with Satan. And listen to me. They were in Judah. The enemy was in Judah where Samson was located. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. You would have thought by now, with Samson's exploits, they'd have been scared. Come on. They'd have been scared because, let me tell you this, he was a tough dude. And there was not too many victories that he had not won. And I can tell you this, if you read his life, listen, it didn't matter if it was one man, if it was a thousand men, he could take them on. 
Are you, are you ready? So the, the very fact that they're coming to Judah in the good guy's territory to seek out Samson leads me to believe that they feel like he's gotten weakened just a little bit. They feel like they, that they've got to end. They feel like maybe that uh, if they work, watch this, if they work through Samson's men, those 3,000 men we told you about, weaken them, maybe they could get to Samson. By the way, can I tell you this? Watch this. If devil can't get to you, he'll be more than happy to get to your family. Yes, sir. If he can't get to you, if you're going to stand rock solid, if you're going to be consistent, if you're going to love the Lord regardless what, then he's not going to say, well, okay, you, I can't get you, Max, so I'll just leave you alone. No! He's going to attack those closest to you. He's going to do everything he can to get in your home and attack those. Is, is somebody awake? Do we know this this morning? That's exactly what he tries to do to you. He's going to try to, he, he's going to try to get in your home. And that's exactly what he did to Samson's 3,000 men. But what they did next was almost unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Let me just show you verse number 13. Judges 15, 13. Watch this. <clears throat> look, look what he said. Now, Samson's friends say something like this. Samson, if you, if, 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 if you really cared about us, you will let us, watch this, I, I can't even hardly say it. Samson, if you care about us, you will let us turn you over to the Philistines. Now wait, wait, wait. Nobody even groaned there. Listen to me. His own men, his own fighting partners, his own marine comrades, his own men said, Samson, listen, this is getting too tough. So here's what we've proposed to do. We've compromised with the Philistines and they said, if we will bring you, if we'll turn you over, they'll let us alone. Now let me just tell you this. If you think you can compromise with them and leave you alone, you are sadly mistaken. Because not only, not only will they get the tough guy, the next step is to come right after you. They're not going to be, listen, listen, they're not going to be settled just to get Samson. Guess who's next? Put your name on that list. If you think that you can compromise with the devil and him to leave you alone, my friend, you've not been around much longer. You've not been around and see the, then the workings of say. So here's what they said. Samson, we hate to do this, but we've just got to bind you up. Look at verse 13. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand. I don't know about you. Is this not incredible? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Somebody awake. Is this not incredible? His own men. Oh, Samson, we hate to do it, but we're going to deliver you. But surely, <laughs> we'll not kill you if that makes you feel any better. We'll, we'll not kill you. We're just going to bind you. So are you happy now, Samson? That's what they said. And they bound him with two new cords or ropes. And they brought him up from the rock. Let me ask you this. Have you ever knew somebody that just turned against you? Have you ever knew somebody that betrayed your trust and you thought would never would do that? Could have been a family member. Could have been a close co-worker that you confided, confided in. And out of the blue, they turned you over. Out of the blue, you didn't even see it coming. But one day, you guys were conversing. One day, everything was great. Work was great. Home was great. And the next day, you get that phone call and your world is shattered. Why? Is because they've just absolutely turned you over. You thought that would never occur in your whole life. Well, take comfort, my friends. If it happened to you, Samson knows what he's talking about. Now see, listen to me. You just thought Delilah was the biggest betrayer. No, 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 no. It wasn't just Delilah, my friend. It was Samson's own men. It wasn't the enemy. Samson's own men that turned him over. I, I want to tell you, my friend, when I started getting a hold of that in my office, I thought, good night. How in the world? 
You see, these 3,000 men refused to take a stand. They wanted to compromise with the enemy. The only problem with that is, is your enemy is not going to play fair. He'll never, never, never play fair. Samson's own men wanted his destruction. When Samson was delivered to the enemy, the enemy had to think, we got him. Look at verse 14. Look at this. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him. Yay! We got him! Uh Uh-oh. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax. That was burnt with fire. His bands loose from off his hands. Guess what now? This is a strong guy, right? Now, now guess what? His hands are free. And if the strong man's hands are free, can I tell you what's coming? He's gonna, he, he, he's gonna do something right here, my friend, because his hands are free. Can I teach you a spiritual lesson here? Be careful, my friend, what you handle. Be careful and keep your hands clean. My friend, can I tell you this? As long as you got your hands, as long as you got the ability to reach out to God, as long as you got the ability to read the Word of God, as long as you keep your hands clean, you've got a chance. But friend, let me tell you this. As long as you allow Satan to bind your hands, my friend, you are doomed. Keep your hands clean. Be careful of what you handle. Be careful of what you allow in your hands. Does somebody understand what I'm just talking about? That's a spiritual truth. Somebody ought to get excited about this morning. And there came a flax in his bands loosed. Now, even at this point, the Philistines felt pretty good about themselves. <laughs> Look at the verse number 15. And he found a new jawbone. Uh-oh. And put forth his hand. I talked about the hand. And he took it and he slew a thousand men. And Samson said with a jawbone, heaps and heaps, have I slain a thousand men. Now, let's stop here a minute and start winding this up. His own men of Judah was willing to turn Samson in, their judge and protector. Samson did break free from the cords, and he's able to kill 1,000 of these bad Philistine soldiers. What a great victory. And the stadium should have been rocking. The stadium should have been going wild. The fans should have just absolutely stormed the court. But something caught my attention, and it was this. I want you to hear this, and then we'll try to close that. Are you with me this morning? Let me have some eye contact. Everybody watch. I never picked this up. And it was this. Samson slew a thousand men. You said you said that, preacher. Okay, but let, let me give you this. As he was slaying those thousand men, where was the 3,000? Yeah. You see, there are people that's always content to let you try to fight the battles by yourself. Where was those 3,000? Could they not have lifted their hands and gave him some moral support if nothing else? Could they have prayed for Samson? Could I'm just throwing this out. Could a hundred of them gone down to at least help? My question was, what was the 3,000? Let me ask you, where are you in the spiritual victories? You see, it's easy for me to point out to these 3,000, but where are you? Where are you when you, when the pastor needs you to lift his hand up? Where are you when the prayer needs to be done? Where are you when chores need to be done? Where are you when the church needs work? Where are you, my friend? Can I tell you, we could use that question on any church. Can I ask you this? Was the 3,000 men looking and just watching? Were, 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 they're certainly not engaged. Samson was swinging and swinging and swinging. I don't tell you something that's worse than that. Samson was, was, by the way, I don't know about this, but, when I go run at the gym every morning, that's a pretty good strenuous activity for me. And I'm a huffing and a puffing and sweating and blah, 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 blah. And I just cannot wait, cannot wait to get that bottle of water. 
<laughs> that, that's kind of how my mornings go. But can I tell you this? Samson slew a thousand men and he was thirsty and not one, three thousand men offered him a cup of water. Is anybody getting this? I, I, I just started putting this together and I started thinking, now wait a minute. Did not Samson do this wonderful work? Did he, did he not slay all of these guys? And he was thirsty. And not one of those men loved him enough to bring him just a cup of water. Do you think maybe, do you think maybe that the Lord understands that? You remember when Jesus is on the cross? Just one cup of cold water would have made the difference. Where was his men? They certainly wasn't at the cross save John. Just one drop of water might have made the difference. If Jesus could have looked out and saw his disciples around the cross, maybe, just maybe would have gave him more encouragement. But no, they were nowhere to be found. Where was Samson? He was swinging and swinging and swinging and slaying and slaying and slaying. He slayed all these guys. He was tired. He was sweating. His legs was throbbing. His arms was weak. And after the battle, he nearly collapsed because he needed a drink of water. And there was not one person to offer him one sip. Is anybody listening? We know the story after this battle. Samson spots a woman by the name of Delilah. She pressed him daily and daily and daily and daily and daily. What are your strength right? What are your strength right? What are your strength right? And finally, because he didn't want to put up with her anymore, he says, Nobody's ever cut my hair. We know that. They cut his hair. But look at let's look, look at verse twenty five of Chris, sixteen twenty five, isn't it? And it came to pass, after Samson's eyes was gouged out, watch this, and their hearts were merry, call for Samson that he may make us sport. Circle that word sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house, and he made them sport. Circle that word. And they set it between two pillars. Can I tell you what they were doing? This once mighty champion for God was nothing reduced, but nothing of a reduced, sour, bitter, eyeless, former judge of Israel. Yeah, he had some victories. Yeah, he could whip a thousand men. But now what is he doing? He's a sightless former judge of Israel. Can't do anything. And you know what they says? They were making sport. You know what that means? They were making fun of him. They were, they, they, and by the way, they were calling him. Can you imagine what they're calling him? Oh, we're Samson. He used to be the tough guy. And can I tell you, now that he can't do nothing, can I tell you? Imagine they were really golden him then, don't you think? Imagine they were calling him and poking him and prodding him and doing everything to make his life that much more miserable. You will find the word sport. But they're, listen, but they're not the same Hebrew word. They have different meanings. The word sport in verse number 25 means to laugh outright. To laugh outright. And the word sport in verse number 27 means to mock. To rejoice or to scorn. After his eyes were put out, the Philistines would call in Samson just for a few laughs. Look, if you will, verse number 26 and we'll wrap up. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may fill the pillars upon the house standeth that I may lean against them. Look at verse number 28. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray, and strengthen me and pray thee only this once. Right here is a couple of things that you need to underline in your Bibles. If you've got a pen, get ready. In verse number 26, he, Samson said these words, Suffer me. Number one, he said the word suffer me. This, mean, this simply means to remain. In Samson's last days, he asked this young boy to stay with him for a moment. But let's draw a spiritual application. Wonder here is when Samson had his eyes picked out. I wonder if he would have just chosen months ago that he would have had the Lord stay by him if things would have turned out differently.
I wonder if he'd have just stayed on track and followed God. Now he wouldn't have been with his eyes played out and wanting a teen boy to stay with him. He was all alone. Listen, he, he had nobody. And he was telling this young boy, just stay with me just a little bit longer. Just stay with me a little bit longer. Can I tell you? How many of us have crawled, crawled, cried out to God? God, just stay with me a little bit longer. God, just let me know that you're here just a little bit longer. You know what I'm talking about this morning? The songwriter Ruth Jones wrote these words. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure, your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. You see, not only did Samson say, suffer me, but in verse number 28, he said, remember me. That means to call or to make mention. Here, this flawed hero wants the Lord to call to him to mind one more time. He was saying something like this, Lord, remember me. Remember me, Lord, I was the judge. Remember me, Lord, when I was the strong man of Israel. Lord, don't forget me again. Can I tell you? Listen to me, listen to the preacher. My friend, if you're not careful, your sins can separate you between a relationship between you and your God. And I want to tell you, my friend, this is where Samson was. Now he's calling out for God to remember him. God, don't forget me. God, one more time. Can I just know that you're there? My friend, I want to tell you and encourage you this morning. It's a whole lot better if you just stay on the same track. It just stay following the Lord no matter how tough it gets. No matter if you don't know what's going on, God does. But don't get to this situation that Samson was by. He asked him to suffer me. Stay with me one more time, little boy. Lord, remember me. Don't forget me, God. Do you remember all of those things that I used to do? And in verse number 28, he says one more time, he says, strengthen me. Strengthen me. Is that a little bit seemed odd to you? This was the man that had all the strength and the the physical strength he ever needed. Now he asked God to give him one more last dose of strength. Now, you know the story as I close. God was under no obligation to him whatsoever. Because we, we already know what he did. He could have let Samson die a humiliating death. And certainly he died as, as a man that, that, that could have avoided all this. But God gave him that one more strength. Push those pillars. Like just put me on the pillars. Just my hair's growing out and I can't see. So put my hand on the pillars. And can I tell you this? I don't know this. But I just have a feeling. Before Samson did what he did. God. Give me this last opportunity to make you look good. God, give me this last opportunity to get rid of these people that hate your name. And I don't know, maybe before he went to heaven, maybe, maybe Samson said this, Oh God, I'm sorry if I would have just lived for you. If I would have just trusted you more, I wouldn't have been in this position. But Lord, I'm coming. I'm coming. He pushed those pillars. And he committed suicide right there in the spot. Here was a mighty man of God, the judge. One of the most important positions of the land. Matter of fact, he was born to take revenge on the Philistines. You can read that story. And now he died of death of suicide. Who would have ever thought? Who would have ever thought a man that would have started out so bold would have ended up with his eyes out. And as they cleared the rubble and pulled out his old body and his eyes plucked out of his head, I wonder what they thought. Here was a man with so much potential. I wonder when you die if somebody at your funeral will say something like that. Here was a lady, here was a man that had so much potential for God, but they just threw it. Come on. They just threw it all away. What about you? What about you? You see, our question this year is, what about you? Where are you? When people start reading your obituary, when people start talking about you, what are they going to say? This is a man that could have had, should have had, had all of the potential in the world, 
but look where they ended up. Samson had every advantage that you and I maybe not ever have. I don't know. We sure got some mighty good advantages now. We got the completed word of God. We got the house of God to instruct us. We've got the spirit, the witness that will teach us in all things. My friend, we got it pretty good here. And yet we're not taking advantage of the things that God has given us. Samson right here died a broken man. All because he chose to live a life that was in disobedience to Christ. Father, we ask you, Lord, to, is the very best we know. Father, he had some victories along the way. We, we certainly don't question that. But Lord, when we look at his life, we often look at what could have been. I wonder, Lord, if he could have done so much more. What if he'd have just stayed true to God all of his life? And what about us? Do you feel sometimes that your life is adrift? You feel like sometimes that you're not standing as strong as you once did? Maybe the Lord is calling you this morning to say, let's get some things shored up. There's getting to be some leaks in the boat. Why don't we plug those before you sink? Why don't we start making a difference right where you are? Father, we know that you're in this place and we ask you, Lord, to do what we cannot do. We ask you, Lord, to guard our hearts. And Lord, if there's a spiritual decision, we pray, Lord, that that will be done today. In Jesus' name, would you stand with us? As Brother Randy sings, would you be obedient to the Spirit of God how He moves you to do?